and is completing the process to become a minister of the word and sacrament. So we give thanks for Amy. I wanted also to share that for those of you who are moderators of committees or um, leaders and committees and programs here at Covenant, all of you are asked to submit end of the year reports to Sybil King. The end of the year report is just simply an outline of the things that you've done this past year so that we can put it together in a summary report to share with the congregation um, sometime in January. I'm asking that you all submit those um, reports um, by the end of the year, if possible, December 31st. And if you have any questions, you can contact or be in touch with your session liaison of your committee to give you more guidance. Many of you have seen in the e-news that we're working on um, creating a new pictorial directory. We are asking that you submit pictures of yourself and your family, either individually or together, to Sybil King and the church office so that she can begin working on those documents. They don't need to be uh, professional pictures. You can take it from your phone. Just make sure that they have a good, um, that, that you can see your face. Um, and if you need help, our youth group is willing to come and to work with you to take the pictures and make sure that they get to the right place. We want to lift up prayers for the many people that are listed in our worship bill um, in our worship document. I'm going to say it now just because I haven't done it for the past couple of months, a couple of weeks actually. Um, there are many in our community who've lost loved ones, um, many who have um, prayers on their hearts. So I'd like to lift up Farai Chicomo and family. Sybil Henderson and family. Our neighbor across the street, Mr. C. Ray Jones, many of you know that his house caught fire. Um, Reverend Patrice Nelson is in prayer for her sister. I encourage you to lift up prayers for her. Jean Prier, Barbara Robinson and family, Isaac Robinson and family, Alice Sharp and family, Terry Robinson and family, and most recently, Ms. Tina Webb, lost a niece. So please remember to keep these members and friends of our community in prayer. And if you're able, reach out to them and let them know that we are thinking about them. As always, we have Tuesday morning prayer, um, Tuesday afternoon. It's at noon. But in the first of the year, I'll move it back to in the morning because I think in the afternoon, people have, they're in the middle of their work days. So we'll go back in January to meeting at 7 a.m., for prayer on Tuesday morning online. Then there's Wednesday evening Bible study. It's every week at 6 p.m. That's also online. And you all are invited to join us for adult Sunday school every Sunday online um, at 845. And then there's also children and youth online Sunday school every other Sunday or each Sunday. We are preparing for um, a New Year's Eve service, so mark your calendars for that. It will probably be a joint um, service with St. Joseph's Church and other churches in the community at St. Joseph's. I will be sending out information about that in the e-news. Seeing that there are no other announcements, so grateful that you all are here again today. Let us continue on in our worship. Good morning on this bright and beautiful day, and I'm happy to be here to see all of you here with us, and also good morning to those of you who are worshiping online with us. Let us prepare for the call to worship. Come, let us rejoice this day in the God who is near, in everyone around us. We will sing glad songs of the one who is rebuilding neighborhoods in our midst. Come, let us rejoice always in Jesus, who baptizes us with hope and compassion. 
we will join in choruses of praise of the one who brings justice to the forgotten in our midst. Come, let us rejoice again and again in the spirit who offers us new life in every moment. We will sing full throttle of the one who fills us with gifts to share with everyone in our midst. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, O come, O come, Emmanuel, come into our hearts and bring hope and faith and joy and peace and the purity of Christ. This is the season for lifting up our hearts in thanksgiving as we celebrate the coming of our Lord and Redeemer. We are not the me, nor the am I, nor the I generation, but the body of Christ. And we are here to glorify your name. Lift us up and remind us that this is certainly not just a time of the COVID crisis, but a season for glorifying your name and thanking you for your redeeming gift to us. Bless those who are listening to the word this morning and bless the deliverer of the word. Let us use it to lift up others in prayer and seek to serve them in remembrance of the birth of your son, Jesus and especially prayers for the families of those in Kentucky and neighboring states who have suffered because of the tornadoes. These we ask in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, I pray, amen. Today's Advent reading is titled The Magnificat, and it is adapted from Starry Black Night, a Womanist Advent devotional journal. The Magnificat is the canticle Mary who sings and proclaims when she is visiting her cousin Elizabeth, who is also pregnant with John the Baptist. It is the proclamation of a messianic birth in which we are all invited to take part, not only as witnesses, but as fellow children of God. I hear the Magnificat and go back to the book of Genesis, to the Garden of Eden, where our creation myth began. I think of Mary's song, Wailing in the Air, back to when Adam and Eve plucked from the fruit of the tree of life, back to the origin of human beings violating sustainable relationship with God's creation. A creation, this planet, this rock, this earth, hurling through space that has always been a paradise. As Mary sings, she speaks of the liberating new way of life that has come to draw us back to sustainable relationships or love with all of God's creation. So, 
I ask, what are your expectations of a Messiah in this world broken by human design? Are you willing to do the difficult, yes, even hard, spiritual, and emotional work of dealing with the things you don't want to see or hear about yourself and society? Or do you wish for a bubblegum Christ, swaddled and cute in a manger, filled with a hollow gospel and a choice to be birthed alongside our brother Jesus or to remain asleep as God continues to do what he has come to do. Amen, Miss Murphy. The call to reconciliation. Why should we fear? 
Whatever we have said or done, whoever we have neglected, or whatever we refuse to do, surely God has washed away with the waters of life flowing into that crystal sea of forgiveness. Let us bring our lives to the one who comes to give us hope and life in this and every season as we pray together, saying, We admit, God of Advent, that it is easier to trust a politician's glib words than yours, which were spoken so long ago. We know how afraid we are of tomorrow because of what we do today, ignoring what you brought about so long ago. We who have been given so much from your heart find it hard to share even a smidgen from our abundance. Forgive us, God, our hope, and have mercy on us. Lift us to our feet. Draw us close into your loving embrace. Drench us the buckets of grace drawn from the deep wells of life, so we will have the courage to declare you as our God, as we follow Jesus Christ and have blessed, who has blessed us with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hear these words declaring your forgiveness. As plain as the heart and our chest, the good news is this. God is our hope. God is our life. God is our future. And we will sing aloud and our voices full throttle. We are forgiven and we are saved. Thanks be to God. Amen. Good morning. I hope the children are watching online somewhere, and we hope we have words they can enjoy. We're going to look at Philippians 4, verse 4, and it's a really simple verse. All it says is, rejoice in the Lord and give thanks. I say rejoice. Now, a lot of us think about rejoicing now because it's Christmas time, and particularly if you're young, you begin to think about what magic might come your way and what Santa might bring. But this is something we should have in our hearts every day. And we have reminders that there are things we should be thankful for every day. Maybe you saw the news about this terrible tornado that went through like six states. And people have died and lost homes and lost everything. And we still hear that people are dying from COVID every day. And we see through their terrible accidents that claim lives and injure bodies. But this has not happened to any of us. 
we see the sun shining and we can celebrate, even if it is a little cold, and that's something we give thanks for all the time. We certainly rejoice for the birth of Jesus, the baby who allows us to have grace, which is forgiveness, and the gift of eternal life, but we should be rejoicing every day for our lives, for our health, for our strength, and we should spread that word to others that we are blessed and God is with us every day and a cause for enjoyment and rejoicing every day of our lives. So that's the message for today, to rejoice now during this season, but to rejoice in Jesus all year long. We're gonna have a little prayer about that. Heavenly Father, you are so good to us. Help us to be mindful of the many ways we are blessed and that you are part of our lives as we come and go in this earth. Help us to remember to share your love and to be stewards and share the protection and the message of God with all we encounter, and to encourage all to rejoice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. At this time, I would like to welcome any guests or visitors that we have with us, either here in worship or joining us online. It is such a good thing that when we're able to welcome and be hospitable to new people. So if you are a guest here with us today or online, please feel free to reach out to me or reach out to anyone in our community so that we can make sure that you are greeted and welcomed properly. If there are any guests here today, if you feel comfortable, you're welcome to stand or um, raise your hand so that we can all say hello. <laughs> This is Mr. Symes, it's Amy's husband, so we are so glad that you're here joining us today for worship and also here supporting your wife. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And again, for those who may be joining us for the first time at home, we're grateful for you as well. At this time, we're going to pass the peace of love and understanding, and I've been working, trying to figure out a way that we can pass the peace <laughs> in a way that we could do so um, authentically without touching. So. Um, I'm going to just ask that um, you can recognize that we all have the peace of Christ within us, and then we can give the peace of Christ to someone else. So um, just say the peace of Christ that's in me recognizes the peace of Christ in you. And just take a few minutes to do that to those you see. You don't have to touch, but look at someone. And the peace of Christ that's in me recognizes the peace of Christ in you. So please pass the love and understanding, the peace of Christ in Jesus. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> it feels good. It doesn't feel as good as touching. But I'm grateful that we are able to do that. And it's so good to see each of you again today. Let us prepare our hearts and minds to go before the Lord in prayer. If you would like to lift the name of a person, a place, or a situation that may need prayer, you can do so right where you are. You can say it audibly or quietly within your hearts. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks. And we ask that you hear the names that were lifted, the situations that were lifted, and also receive those things that are unspoken, the things that are within us that we may not have words for. Lord, we trust that you are a present help. And so we come to you during this time asking for and praying for the many things that are happening in our lives and in this world. We certainly lift up our personal and individual struggles, but we also lift up the collective struggles. At this time, there are many, O oh Lord, who are um, living with the effects of the tornadoes 
We pray, O oh Lord, that people come and be a present help, that those who are without power, who have lost loved ones, who have lost homes, that they are comforted during this time, that they know that you sent us to be your hands and feet, but also that you are with us. We pray for those who are living in suffering because of this pandemic. We ask, O oh Lord, that you continue to be a present help and give you thanks for the many of us who are serving, who are working to help bring this to some type of um, understanding so that lives do not continue to be lost, so that people are not walking and living in fear. And we pray for those who have lost so many during these past couple of years. Lord, we lift up this season. We lift up those who are missing loved ones this time of year. We pray for those who are depressed, those who are suffering, those who are facing a Christmas for the first time without someone that they hold dear. We ask, O oh Lord, that you be with them. We ask, O oh Lord, that others come around them. We pray for those who are lonely, our members who are in communities that may have them isolated. We pray for those, O oh Lord, who are in jail, those who are away from families. We ask, O oh Lord, that you be with them also and that we remember the many blessings that we have and help us to return them. We ask these things, O oh Lord, not because we are special, or because we like to pray, but we do it because Jesus instructed us to when he told us to say, Our Father, be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us prepare for our worship through giving as we bring our tithes and offerings. We will not be afraid, loving God, to offer our hopes, our hearts, our treasures to you, but do so willingly, trusting that you will use them to bring life, joy, grace, and peace to all around us. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Dear God, you are good and loving and have done so much for us. We pray that you bless these gifts that have been given in order that your will be done. Amen. For those of you who are here for the first time, if you don't know offering boxes, we won't be collecting offerings in the traditional way that we've done it. You can leave an offering out in the narthex or on the, by the exit as you leave. And you can always give online also as well. Just do so cheerfully. <laughs> Amen. We are now going to go to Lord in the proclamation of the word. And I will be sharing the prayer of illumination and reading the first scripture. 
By the power of your Spirit, O Lord, speak your word to us. O God, show us who you are and who you are calling us to be for the sake of your Son and Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our first reading comes from the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Again, that's Philippians, chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. And I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone because the Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. The second reading today comes from the Gospel of Luke, the third chapter, verses 7 through 18. Again, Luke chapter 3, verses 7 through 18. This is also from the New Revised Standard Version. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now, the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then should we do? In reply, he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none. And whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what should we do? He said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusations, and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I'll be honest with you. I've never been a huge fan of John the Baptist. He's kind of a scary guy. That whole thing about hanging out in the wilderness, wearing animal skins, eating locusts and honey. And he kind of preaches fire and brimstone. When the crowds come to be baptized, the first words out of his mouth are about snakes. And I really don't like snakes, even harmless garden snakes. I just wasn't too sure about John. But then I read what he was saying after the snake part. Luke's gospel is often called the gospel of the poor because it talks about the poor and marginalized more than any other gospel. It is often, however, directed toward those that have power and privilege, and it's about their responsibilities toward those without power. Luke writes with a purpose, and John is the first messenger he uses. I'll give you a hint about that purpose. It's not about maintaining the status quo. It's about bringing the poor up and the rich down. It is the opposite 
of the prosperity gospel. John's words are divided into three sections. You can see this in your Bible because there's a new paragraph each time. And this is true in the Greek New Testament as well. Verses 7 through 9 of the first part. And this is his general message about repentance. Verses 10 through 14 are the second part. And this is John's social gospel. Verses 15 through 17, plus 18 from the next paragraph, are the third part. And this is what John says about Jesus. Now let's talk about those snakes. The crowds come to be baptized, and John says to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? This is one of the places in the text where we know that Luke's gospel has a different purpose than Matthew's. Matthew has John say these words to the Pharisees and to the Sadducees. But here in Luke, John says it to the crowds. In today's passage, it's not directed to the religious leaders. It's to everybody. I like the way the message version of the Bible describes this scene. It says, When crowds of people came out for baptism, because it was the popular thing to do, John exploded. Brood of snakes, what do you think you're doing slithering down here to the river? Do you think a little water on your snake skins is going to deflect God's judgment? It is your life that must change, not your skin. And don't think you can pull rank by claiming Abraham as father. Being a child of Abraham is neither here nor there. Children of Abraham are a dime a dozen. God can make children from stones if God wants. What counts is your life. Is it green and blossoming? Because if it's dead, word, dead wood, it goes on the fire. This text is about repentance. The Greek word for repentance is metanoia, and the literal meaning is a change of mind. It means a change of perspective, and when you change how you see things, this changes the inner person. The way you live your life demonstrates this change of mind. When I was in college, I was active in the Presbyterian campus ministry in Raleigh. As you know, PCM is a great program. That's where I met my husband, actually. The campus minister's office was located in my church in the same way Reverend British's office is located here. The speaker for one of the programs one night was Sister Evelyn Mattern, a Catholic sister very involved in social justice issues in North Carolina. She must have been talking about homelessness in some way because I remember gathering up the courage to ask a question. I slowly raised my hand, and then I asked her, how could she stand to work with homeless people? Because they smell bad. I know. Now, in my defense, I do have a very sensitive nose, and it was an honest question. Fast forward quite a few years later, and I was in Atlanta for training. I had one morning somewhat free, and I had made plans to volunteer at the Open Door community. I had gotten past my smell concern. This was a Catholic worker-style ministry run by two Presbyterian ministers who advocated and supported homeless and marginalized folks and those on death row and in prison. As I drove behind the house to park, I saw a man walking quickly up to the back door. I should have followed him, but I really didn't know where I was going. So I walked around to the front door and knocked. No one answered. One of the men waiting by the door told me the door was locked and would not be opened until they started serving breakfast sometime later. Uh-oh. Now what was I going to do? By this time, it was quite a while after the volunteer coordinator had told me to be there. I stood there for a few minutes and then walked to the side of the house. I could see the room upstairs where the volunteers were doing Bible study. One of the homeless men realized my problem and started yelling up at the room upstairs. He did this several times, and then they closed the windows in the room. Next, he started tossing pebbles at one of the windows. Eventually, someone came out to investigate, and the homeless man explained that I was there to volunteer and needed to come inside. I was amazed. I had come to help, and this man helped me instead. The experience changed how I saw homeless people. It was repentance, and it was a gift. Once John the Baptist had told, has told the crowds they must repent, they ask him what they should do. 
This section is the second place where Luke's gospel is different. Matthew skips the social gospel part completely. John's answers are about changing the status quo. They address inequality and injustice occurring at the, at the time. To these crowds, to the crowds, he said, if anyone has two shirts, give one to someone who needs it. If you have more food than you need, share it with someone who does not have enough. To the tax collectors, stop collecting excessive taxes to satisfy the greed of those in power. You probably remember that later on, Luke is the one who tells the story about Zacchaeus and Jesus. To the soldiers, stop victimizing people with extortion and threats of violence to inflate your salary. This was John's message of social responsibility. One Bible scholar suggests that these individual actions could lead to systemic impacts. For example, if a tax collector stops taking excessive taxes, can the other tax collectors continue to do so? If soldiers can't use extortion to overinflate their salaries, does it make it harder to recruit this type of soldier? What does the shirt seller do if the demand for his shirts goes down? The tax collectors and soldiers worked for the government. How would the Roman Empire react if there were fewer extorted funds to fill the coffers? One scholar has said that the values driving Western society today are profit, personal comfort, exploitation, control, individualism, and dominance. I wonder what John would tell us to do to repent if we were part of those crowds. Would he talk about the school-to-prison pipeline? Would he mention climate change in, our, in the environmental degradation? Would he ask us how we can let immigrant children be locked up and families separated? What would he say to the police and the crowds and the military industrial complex? Would he talk about gun violence? Would he direct us to do less charity work and more justice work? Would he mention consumerism and how capitalism is king? In the last section of the, day, of the text today, the people start wondering if John is the Messiah. He explains how the one who is to come will be different. He says he is not worthy to be his servant. He baptized, he, John baptizes with water, and Jesus will baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. Jesus will separate the wheat from the chaff. I've heard these biblical passages about wheat and chaff, but I didn't really understand the details. One commentator explains it this way. He says, farmers poured wheat from one container to another on a windy day or tossed the wheat into the air with a fork or a shovel so that the chaff would be blown away, leaving the grain clean. The chaff burned with explosive combustion. To this day, farmers know that a fire in a dry wheat field cannot be contained or controlled. The message is clearly one of judgment. Maybe you knew this already, but I learned something. John's purpose in the text today is to prepare the people for the coming of Christ. One of the former pastors of Riverside Church in New York City, Amy Butler, says that Advent is a four-week season of waiting and anticipation of Christmas, the birth of Jesus. Every year we wait, not for the actual birth of a baby, but for the arrival of a world that reflects the message of love that Jesus came to teach us. How do we change from vipers to wheat? I think John's message for us today is to create those changes in our minds that lead to actions that will bring about this world of love, the kingdom of God, to live our lives in ways that reflect our changed perspectives. One theologian describes these actions as the work of solidarity. She says that solidarity is the recognition of our own complacency in the interconnected structures of oppression, our shared interest and responsibility across lines of difference, our accountability to those with less power, and our commitment to take action persistently and with others to challenge and change all forms of domination and injustice, from which we benefit and by which we are harmed. Solidarity 
involves both personal transformation and concrete work for social change. John the Baptist would say, it requires repentance. Many of you may already be doing this work. If so, thank you. Please continue. If you need a little help in changing your perspective, Brian Stevenson would tell us to find ways to get proximate to the people who are suffering. In this season of Advent, as we reflect on these things, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. The Lord is near. May it be so. Amen. Once again, I thank you all for joining us today on this day. For those of you who are here and for those of you who are watching us online, it is my prayer that we can hear the, the word reflected through Amy and consider how we can move from vipers to wheat. I'd like to invite you all to join with us here at Covenant. In doing so, personally and individually, how we can share this good news with others. You know, Jesus invited people into ministry. Jesus knew that he did not come alone, but, but he came so that he can draw others, so that they can also draw others, and then they can draw others, so that all can feel the peace and goodness of his coming, so that all would know that they are forgiven. He invited people by saying, abide in me, and I will abide in you. If you're looking for a church home, please reach out to myself or others here at Covenant and let us know who you are so that we can be in touch. Seeing that there's nothing else to say, we will have our closing hymn and our benediction. May you all have a great week.
hear these words of benediction. Setting aside our fears and worries, let us go. We will go as God's people on this day to remind everyone that God is as close to them as the beats of their hearts. Setting aside our prejudices and assumptions, let us go. We will go as Jesus' followers this day to gather up the forgotten and bring them home, to embrace the lonely as sisters and brothers. Setting aside our expectations and demands, let us go. We will go as those graced by the Spirit to share with others the waters from grace's deep wells, to offer that peace which never comes to an end. In the name of God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit, let us all say Amen. 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 It's okay, you can... <laughs> Thank you. 